Welcome to another episode of House of Decline. Quick ad read right up top. Go to patreon.com slash house of decline. As little as $3 a month, 30 extra comics. Crazy amount. You don't get that many comics anywhere. Not even at a wet market in Canada. We have wet markets up here. They're, they're, uh, we, instead of exotic meats, though, we exchange exotic syrups. Ha <laughs> ha! Canada syrup. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got on this episode, uh, in a continuation of our Scott Adams reading series, uh, we are reading the book or excerpts from his philosophical text, God's Debris. <laughs> And for this, we have returning champion Rory Blank. Howdy. And actual philosophy knower slash reader uh, Lux. How you doing, Lux? Uh, so I sent this book to you last night, Lux, and, uh, you, you managed to read almost all of it in, in a fit of passion. Uh, it's not particularly hard to read though. It's sort of, um, it's sort of like a baby's first metaphysical text. <laughs> it's like, um, I described it to someone this way, which is, it's like Scott Adams is trying to do Plato, except that Socrates and Glaucon have CTE. <laughs> um, it's insane. It's the it's it. Uh, there's so I have so many angry thoughts about it from yeah. a structural and ideas perspective. Uh, we're gonna get I right read into it. Berserk. <laughs> instead, I thought about reading it, but uh, good instead, better choice. Yeah, yeah. Guts has a, a giant sword and a, a gun arm. Mm-hmm. There, I don't see any giant swords or gun arms in this. I think Berserk is also a lot more philosophically coherent and yes. uh, a, a lot more uh, artistic in its uh, elaborations um, about it, the nature of the universe. I mean, it is you know one of the most beautifully rendered pieces of art I've ever looked at, and every single page of it makes me want to uh, try harder as an artist. And uh, it, it's inspiring the story, and it's got booby demons. Hell yeah! And got it all. Uh, this is 127 pages. Lo- no, yes, 127 yeah. pages long, but large pages. type. It's in large type. It's large, type. <laughs> large font. Yeah, very, very large. It's 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 a uh, pamphlet sized. I didn't read yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured just choosing random excerpts from the text like the I Ching will provide some sort of insight. But Lux, you have actually read it. Have you have you made some notes on some choice chapters? Uh, I didn't note any choice. Well, yes, actually, there's one. Um, I don't I think it's page 18 uh, where it is, but there's a part. So a lot of the, a lot of this book uh, as I read it, is basically about the dumbest boy in the world goes to a <laughs> house where an old man is. Yeah. And then the old man is very stupid, but the dumbest <laughs> boy in the world is like, well, you're old and you have a fireplace, so you must be smart. And mm-hmm. the old man proceeds to just sort of say things. And yeah. there's one part where the old man is like trying to disabuse the boy of his foolish notions of whatever and literally ends up doing fucking magnets how do they work uh um, you're oh my god you're right page 18 it's science uh we'll get to that well that will be the first thing we get to after the introduction i want to read some of the introduction just oh, the to, intro is also great yes well, you'll see the intro is very dull Est- establish where we are um yeah so j- just a little background on this of course scott adams uh starting in i think 89 maybe uh, slightly later than that started the dilbert comic strip which was very innocuous uh office-based uh humor actually for its first four years it wasn't even office-based he hit upon that and uh sort of the the big surge of 90s corporate culture uh it, he hit upon that at just the right time, which sort of, I think, explains Whoa. the popularity of Dilbert. You know, the other uh, the other stuff that came about from that is stuff like Office Space or even, you know, Fight Club to some degrees about that 90s corporate office culture. And so, you know, Dilbert was part and parcel of that. I think this sort of popularity, this sudden surge of popularity if Scott Adams wasn't already megalomaniacal and insane before, this definitely didn't help 
because it made him think that he was capable of anything and that um, well, I made it, I succeeded, so it must be based on some sort of merit that I have, some sort of uh, knowledge that other people aren't privy to, because look, I made it with a stupid little cartoon, hence I must be a big-brained person. And so I what's funny about of, this... I mean, he was capable of anything as in all the things, and anything as in any single thing, <laughs> both of which yeah. were incorrect assumptions. Yeah. And, and I just realized that uh, Dilbert started three months before Berserk, <laughs> whoa whoa just tying wow. that together uh yeah, well, well, well while here. scott adams was making his stupid little office man comic kentaro mura was uh pouring his life every fiber of his being into drawing yeah. a cool guy with a big sword yeah making uh further proof of how much of a coward scott adams is yeah he could have been doing dill berserk and uh, oh, you know, it would have been he could have he could have had a lot of very intricate little cross hatching to give a sense of texture and space and uh, dimensionality. But no, uh, he. It, what's amazing is how little his style has evolved. Do you think after no. like twenty years he would want to develop 20, thirty years? Uh, he, forty years? No, gradient. thirty years. Yeah, thir thirty years. Uh, thirty-three years. I'm thirty-three. I yeah, was born that year. <laughs> yeah yeah the year of the dilbert um yeah i think what's I, also very funny is intertwined with his permanently <laughs> <laughs> yeah um what's really funny about this is he thinks of himself in the early 2000s atheist sense as a, comp a combatter of woo woo takes when in reality he is like this is like the most woo woo baby brain shit you know it's like if it's like if alan watts huffed paint thinner <laughs> um yeah it really truly is um and alan watts you know i don't know what you think about alan watts but uh you know he's he's easy to get which is why he's sort of like the first guy that a lot of people get into okay. in terms of like spiritual or philosophical uh pop pop philosophy i like um, the video game where you're an animal that rolls around while alan watts says stuff but i think it's more to do with it the fact that you're you get to be a zebra rolling around doing stuff yeah <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that game is fun that game I, rules, if, yeah. if anything i'm kind of distracted by alan watts in, er, intervening and in me just looking at david o'reilly's charming low polygon animals yeah yeah but i i think there is a quality to alan watts which sort of makes it attractive that sort of allegorical or uh spiritual pontificating quality that makes it good it's you know the same thing that also makes like a book like paulo coelho's the alchemist very enticing and in sort of like a pop philosophy manner there's this uh, almost like sermonish quality to it that i think uh, resonates with a lot of people and i mentioned that just because that is the tone of this book this sort of like sermon this extended sermon by this old man character who i can only assume is a self-insert of scott adams is it the garbage man it's no but that it is similar to the garbage man because scott adams has an enduring obsession with incredibly smart people being in otherwise uh meaningless or mundane positions that's a that's a frequent thing in the scott adams canon because so i think that's how he viewed himself as this incredibly smart person who was in this mundane situation he saw um goodwill hunting and thought damn that's me for real yeah yeah well i think that's the that's the whole like a huge swath of conservative people do actually believe that it's not your fault i'm this incredibly smart person who's been uh foisted into this position below my station and that is why you know and who's doing it the gays or you know the some some sort of out group but anyway juice 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 juice, 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 juice. it's juice, always juice. it's always what did sartre say just sort of just anti-semitism socialism of the idiot yeah yeah he was right uh <laughs> we love him we love Sartre. We love, that, we love that weird googly-eyed Frenchman. Yeah, yeah, he's cool. He's cool. You don't know where he's looking. Um, <laughs> introduction. Uh, it starts off real strong. Oh, man. This is just... not a Dilbert book. It contains no humor. <laughs> Already an amazing joke in the first two lines. <laughs> yeah, he comes out hot. Uh, directly contradicting himself by being, those two lines being incredibly funny for some reason. This is this is not a Dilbert book. It contains no humor. 
I call it a 132 page thought experiment wrapped in a fictional story. I'll explain the thought experiment part later. God's debris doesn't fit into normal publishing cubby holes. There is even disagreement about whether the material is fiction or nonfiction. I contend that it is fiction because the characters don't exist. Some people contend that it is non-fiction because the opinions and philosophies of the characters might have lasting impact on the reader. What? No, 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 no. What? No, That's no. not, logically, that doesn't follow. That's not what those words mean. And the people who he says he's having these conversations with don't exist. No, this, the conversation you had with yourself in the shower, Scott Adams. Um, here's a really uh, interesting passage. Uh, as I continue, uh, the story contains no violence, no sexual content, and no offensive language. But the ideas expressed by the characters are inappropriate for young minds. People under the age of 14 should not read. <laughs> 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 oh my god, this is so, he has such a high opinion of himself. Um, the target audience for God's Debris is people who enjoy having their brains spun around inside their skulls. <laughs> Every sentence of the intro is psychotic. It's so boastful. <laughs> it's so, he's got the braggadociousness of like a young Lil Wayne or something like that. Yeah, it's crazy the degree to which he thinks this is the smartest book in the world. Uh, after a certain age, most people are uncomfortable with new ideas. That certain age varies by person. But if you're over 55, mentally, you probably won't enjoy this thought experiment. If you're 80 going on 35, you might like it. If you're 23, your odds of liking it are very good. Why did he devote this entire paragraph to the, his numbers? He has, he has some numbers to show that. <laughs> We're using precision here. That's why we're showing you a range of numbers. Okay. Um, the story's central character has a view about God that you've probably never heard before. <laughs> okay. If you think you would be offended also, by Also, I just want to quickly point out yeah. that isn't true. <laughs> yes, this is well-trodden ground. Yeah, uh, the, the, he, is, he is hitting 100-year-old reruns. Well... You know, he 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 came to it independently, though. That's the thing. Is and that that's why it's the nope, even worse? Scott thing. Adams invented it. Scott Adams invented it. You got to be a real genius to come up with uh, the Dill Burrito and also a novel understanding of God. And Scott Adams is that genius. Yeah, he he invented uh, Scott Gnosticism or Scottsticism. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you've never what heard what before we, the central got? character if you think you would be offended by a fictional character's untraditional view of god please don't oh, read no. this so yeah this comes out right in 2003 right at the height of like the new atheist movement you know or when it's not at the height but when it's just sort of starting to boil over into public consciousness uh so it has lots of like mm, are you triggered religious people are you are you thinking about this in a way that might stoke your logic brain? Hmm? Hmm, religious people? Um, the opinions and philosophies expressed by the characters are not my own, except by coincidence in a few spots not worth mentioning. Please don't write me with passionate explanations of why my views are wrong. You won't discover my opinions by reading my fiction. No, we eventually discovered them through social media, and <laughs> they, were, they were not good. Uh, the no central character to learn that them. <laughs> um, the central character in God's debris knows everything, literally everything. This presented a challenge to me <laughs> as a writer. When you consider all of the things that can be known, I don't know much. My solution was to create smart sounding answers using the skeptics creed. The simplest explanation is usually right. Okay. Damn. Is that the skeptics creed? That's Occam's razor has nothing to do with skepticism, does it? Yeah, not as far as I know. Um, I think Scully says it a few times in X Files. Like, so she, maybe that's where he's yeah. getting it from. Yeah, he, X Files, which was, which was still hot at the yeah. time. Yeah, and she is the queen of skepticism. Yeah, so I think we were in Doggett era at this time, though. That was when well, I stopped watching. It's that, pretty good, a, Doggett era. It's I, 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 okay. Well. <laughs> It wasn't even because of my uh, my my fixation with Mulder. I was always more into Scully. I had a Scully action figure. I thought she was the coolest person in the world. Yeah. Uh, it's the Agent Doggett. Uh, is I I 
I couldn't figure out what, what it was at the time. Just as a kid, I knew there's something about his face I don't like. It scares me. Yeah. I figured out like three years ago, it's because when I was like four, my dad showed me Terminator 2 for the first time. That's too young to watch oh, that yeah. movie. <laughs> and so every time I was looking at Agent Doggett, I was just thinking that guy is going to stab somebody through the head with his hand. Yeah. T-1000 is a very spooky character. But yeah, yeah I just had some... I just, had a fixation on like being terrified of robert patrick yeah robert i mean he's got a pretty he's got a scary face i think he's cool now oh yeah he's very he's cool. so cool looking yeah <laughs> leather rocks yeah uh he Play, would be plays great a, plays a great racist that guy in in peacemaker yeah uh, in the in the uneven but still enjoyable show peacemaker he yeah. plays a good racist in that show i think he's in other stuff too i mean i think of john voight the real life racist <laughs> you should have John Voight and Robert Patrick as the kid and the old man in the God's Debris movie. Uh, the simplest exp explanation approach turned out to be more provocative than I expected. The simplest explanations for the big questions, capitalized, ended up connecting paths that don't normally get connected. <laughs> he thinks he's thinking all of this for the first time. Oh, yeah. It's almost it's, sweet in its innocence. It's like this. It's the wild thing that you do see on the Internet a lot. But this is like really like the most distilled version of it where like someone gets one twentieth of the way towards a real philosophy idea on their own, mm -hmm. thinks that they've solved it and invented it. And then it's just like, oh, it turns out I'm a brain genius. It's funny that he says this is directed towards young people because this is like what you do as a teenager. You like make a, a vague discovery on your own, like you said, and then you think, I'm the smartest guy in the world. I'm, and I'm young, so I have no context or perspective for any of this. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, and also, yeah, the belief that you can intuit your way to like the smartest philosophies without like reading anything or having done any homework beforehand. You can just come up with it by yourself if you think hard enough yeah it's um wrong to think that yes but uh he did it he did it god damn it uh the description of reality in god's debris isn't true as far as i know <laughs> but, but it's oddly compelling therein lies the thought experiment try to figure out what's wrong with the simplest explanations the central character states a number of scientific facts in scare quotes some of his weirdest statements are consistent with what scientists generally believe not true yeah he says a lot of wrong things some of what he says is creative baloney designed to sound true see if you can tell the difference you might love this th <laughs> great uh oh you might love this thought experiment wrapped in a story or you might hate it but you won't easily get out of get it out of your mind you're right about that scott adams for maximum enjoyment, share God's debris with a smart friend and then discuss it while enjoying a tasty beverage. I'm doing okay. that right now, Scott. Yeah, I, I got a coffee. His... Yeah. Yeah, I got a Gatorade. Got? Oh, I got a yeah. Diet Coke. Yeah, we all have oh, our yeah. tasty beverages. Scott. You know, that's the first right thing you've said all day. And uh, we're going to acknowledge that. So uh, the first part of the book, it's uh, the, the only real narrative part where the some kid picks up a package and delivers it to an old man. And the old man is, uh, you know, sort of a stock eccentric wizened figure. Uh, so we'll just get to uh, Lux. Do you have uh, the thing open in front of you? Yeah, I do. Uh, do you want to read the passage science uh, on well, page before... 18? Before we get there, I want to show, read you the part where he sort of like sets the tone for the old man, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. There's a really great, uh, so that first he talks about like coin flips and it, it, and is absolutely wrong about probability. Yeah. Um, but then he says, uh, um, he says, let me ask you a simple question. Did you deliver the package or did the package deliver you? <laughs> By then, I was a little annoyed with his cleverness, Fuck, man. but admittedly engaged. I didn't know the old man's situation, but he wasn't as feeble-minded as I'd first thought. <laughs> Whoa, this guy, you know, he's got some Coens. He knows yeah. about stuff. I glanced at my watch, almost lunchtime. I decided to see where this was heading. I delivered the package, I answered. That seemed obvious enough. If the package had no address, would you have delivered it here? I said no. Then would you agree that delivering the package required the participation of the package? The package told you where to go? 
I suppose that's true in a way, but it's the least important part of the delivery. I did the driving and lifting and moving. That's the important part. How can one part be more important if each part is completely necessary? <laughs> look, look, I said, I'm holding the package and I'm walking with it. That's delivering. I'm delivering the package. That's what I do. I'm a package delivery guy. That's one way to look at it. Another way is that both you and the package got here at the same time and that both of you are necessary. I say the package delivered you. So that's sort of like sort of presents the kind of like Nate type of thing that's going to be going on for the yeah. rest of the book. Yeah. What if, what if your thoughts were instead words, you know, he just says anything and then the, the young man is blown away by the profoundness of that statement. It, it reminds me a lot of Joe Rogan. Yeah. Um, Cause like the Joe Rogan dynamic, and I haven't even talked to you about this on, on, on the show before, but like there's this dynamic where like, he seems like, a, like a weird man who lives in a cave who thinks that anyone who can do anything is like a wizard yeah and is like <laughs> amazed by any piece of information yeah um and that's like basically the vibe of this because like the package didn't deliver him because the kid is right delivering is a word with a meaning yeah <laughs> um and he delivered the package yeah but yeah let me pull up the the thing about the magnets because this i lost it when i read this uh yeah yeah uh page uh 18 yeah if, uh, god's debris by the way is a free pdf if you just look up god's debris pdf you can follow along with us uh not to it's be on... confused with a uh, god's debris when he comes back and returns all the foreskins yeah <laughs> oh. oh i thought it was about god making a contraption that would pull his foreskin back down uh using a system of levers <laughs> could God create a ball so heavy that it could restore his foreskin? <laughs> that's the kind of question. That's, see, that's like a more interesting philosophical question than anything that goes on in this book. Yeah. Um, uh, sci yeah, so, science. So, Page yeah, 18, a second, chapter heading called oh, Science. Uh, what what is this about? spun around inside my skull. Yeah. Uh, so he says, let's talk about science for a moment, he replied. Uh I was relieved. I like science. It was my favorite subject in school. Religion may be uncomfortable. It's better not to think too much about religion, but science was made for thinking. It was based on facts. Um, an insane, insane piece of Sure. Science. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know a lot about science, I asked. Almost nothing, he said. I figured this would be a short conversation, and it was just as well because my lunch hour was running out. Consider magnets, the old man said. <laughs> if you hold two magnets near each other, they are attracted, yet there is nothing material connecting them. Yes, there is, I corrected. There's a magnetic field. You can see it when you do that experiment with the metal shavings on a piece of paper. You hold a magnet under the paper, and the shavings are organized along magnetic lines. That's the magnetic field. So you have a word for it. It's a field, you say. <laughs> but you can't get a handful of this thing for which you have a name. You can't fill a container with a magnetic field and take it with you. You can't cut it into pieces, and you can't block its power. You can't block it. I didn't know that. You can alter a magnetic field by adding other magnetic material, but there's no non-magnetic material you can put between two magnets to block them. This field of yours is strange stuff. We can see its effect and we can invent a name for it, but it doesn't exist in any physical form. How can something that doesn't exist in physical form have influence over the things that do? Maybe it has physical form, but it's small and we can't see it. That's possible. Maybe there are tiny magnetrons or something, I said, <laughs> making up a word. So that's the magnet section. That's the literally... magnets. How do they work? It's yeah, just, it's just Music, it's all magic. Possible. You can't even hold it. It's just there in the air. Pure yeah. motherfucking magic. It's <laughs> crazy how dumb this book is. Yeah, this is think, uh, ICP's Miracles is more thought out than this. Well, because yeah. ICP's Mir Miracles is about divine inspiration and about being, you know, religiously imparted with these, uh, you know, things in the world that seem fantastical because of the providence of God. It is in many ways the opposite of uh, God's Debris, which is about this sort of uh, uh, tortured assumed uh rationality that that colors everything but is actually just you know some some dumb guy feeling stuff out in the darkness uh <laughs> solar eclipse and vicious weather fifteen thousand juggalos together yeah uh you know I, I i've seen you know a million people come together as equals you know that's a much more positive and uplifting statement than this maybe you think the things that are are not really yeah, um, th this book is like sitting there with a fedora on just being like, yes, I see your point, but consider the alternative yeah. of what if it's not uh, that that there's a sort of like debunking style 
that I blame John Stossel for. I think John Stossel is the author of this modern debunking style of thing. Um, the things that you take for granted in society, uh, they actually aren't the way you think they are. And this got uh, expanded into many news formats like Penn and Teller's bullshit. And, you know, even yeah. even nominally left wing or vaguely left wing shows like Adam Ruins Everything has this format as well. Um, and uh, it, it really gets abused a lot by sort of libertarian types because they, they have convinced themselves that they're above it all. They have achieved, you know, the the uh, ultimate political and philosophical Zen. So, <laughs> so you're yeah, saying think... is David Schultz should have slapped Stossel harder. Uh, <laughs> wait, I didn't know that. Who slapped Stossel? Uh, David Schultz, a professional wrestler. He asked, uh, Stossel asked him, is wrestling real? And, uh, Schultz just punched him or That's slapped cool. him. Should have slapped, cool him, harder. Yeah. slapped him harder. I, I think, think so. I think he should have, he should have brain damaged him. Um, uh, but what, so the, one other thing about this section is it also gets at the other thing about this book, which is that by the simplest possible explanation, he basically means leaving out many pertinent details yeah. of the question being asked. This happens in the book where he's like, now you may think this, but what if I explained it this way? And it's like, well, yeah, if you leave out a bunch of the reasons people think a thing, it doesn't make as much sense now, yeah. does it? But if you like, are... <laughs> What if I was intentionally obfuscatory? Then would you think of it differently? Yeah, it's like, there, I forget, there's a bunch of parts, especially maybe more towards the back, where like, he makes these claims are sort of like, people do this because of this, or like, oh, there's one part where he talks about evolution, he's like, if evolution were real, wouldn't we see new things evolving all the time? But we don't, and it's like, no, we do. Yeah, we do, there's <laughs> microevolution, we can see it happening. Go yeah. constantly observing this. Yeah. Um, and it's like stuff like that that makes it just like this whole book feel totally insane. No, no but like, Lux, Lux, you don't understand. Things. Some of what the old man is saying is not correct. So it's up to you, which I think is so funny because that means he could just write whatever he wanted without having to fact check anything. And <laughs> just just in once again, intuit his way to like a better philosophy, but uh, without having done any actual work or <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh let's just let's scroll around uh and uh come up i want to i want to just ch go to random pages and see if we can uh we can come up with some gold so i randomly selected page 38 reincarnation ufos and god oh this is a good one i didn't know how much of the old man's opinions to take at face value Everything he talked about had a kind of logic to it, but so do many things that are nonsense. I decided it was best just to listen. Whatever was happening to me, at least it was different. I like different. So he's getting groomed by this old man. <laughs> he's in the process of getting groomed uh, through, through what if language was actually thoughts? What, what, what if language was actually the moon? Uh, the blue that you see, level. the blue that I see. You yeah. ever think about that, man? Yeah. Why do they you have no idea that you just nailed what this section is. Yeah. Why do they call them fingers? Do they fing? Yeah, yeah. Why My don't hands. they make the whole plane out of the black box? Fuck. Uh, hands can fuck. Touch anything we could totally groom themselves. Scott Adams with these questions. <laughs> he started again. If you want to understand UFOs, reincarnation, and God, do not study UFOs, reincarnation, and what? God. Study people. <laughs> are you saying none of these things are real? I was offended by his certainty, given the thousands of eyewitness accounts for each of those things. When have people eyewitness God or reincarnation? <laughs> I guess, you know, in religious texts, he's assuming this... But why is this person who's established as being uncomfortable with religion suddenly willing to go to bat for reincarnation and God? Oh, we skipped the part where he is like, God's are I believe in God. He's around. And okay. then the guy does some like classic, like, if God's real, how do we have free will? Yeah. Like, if question. God's real, why are our eyes real? Yeah. He does a lot of that stuff. That's a little bit earlier. Uh, it's stupid. It sucks, which makes it the same as the rest of the book. Uh. No, he said, I am saying that UFOs, reincarnation, and God are all equal in terms of their reality. Do you mean equally real or equally imaginary? 
Your question reveals your bias for a binary world where everything is real or <laughs> imaginary. The distinction lies in your perceptions, not in the universe. Your inability to see other possibilities and your lack of vocabulary are your brain's limits, not the universe's. There has to be a difference between real and imagined things, I countered. My truck is real. The Easter Bunny is imagined. Those are different. As you sit here, your truck exists for you only in your memory, a place in your mind. <laughs> the Easter Bunny lives in the same place. They are equal. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yes, but I can go out and drive my truck. I can't pet the Easter Bunny. Was the rain from this morning real? Of course. But you can't see or touch that rain now. <laughs> this is so dumb. It's like, was... it's like this weird car crash of like super crazy pure David human empiricism with like brain in a vat Descartes stuff. Yeah. But like with none of the interesting implications. Just like, just like imagine what if not that. Mm-hmm. It's so good. It's like, it's just crazy that he was able to get a hundred pages of this down without ever being like, oh, I've been repeating myself a lot. Yeah, this is really just bog standard solipsism. You know, nothing is really real because your perception is the only thing that matters that governs whether it's real or not. Which is funny. No, because this, this, the... is, this is a pure Scott Adams invention. You got to be a real genius to come up with a dog and that is rude. And also the idea that only you exist. <laughs> and yeah. also this whole this whole text, I'm very worried, is another attempt by him to hypnotize me into jacking off. Yeah, yeah, he's going to hypnotize me into getting divorced. <laughs> uh, so, sorry to cut you off. Oh, uh, there's nothing, nothing to cut off there. Uh, or Lux it sounded like he was about to oh, say something. Well, my microphone got disconnected, so then oh. I forgot what I was going to say. So you saved me in a lot of ways. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, like the Easter Bunny, the past exists only in your mind, he said. Likewise, the future exists in your mind because it has not happened. <laughs> Everything is such galaxy brain. Like, oh my God. Um, like, okay, so the, the read the next couple sentences and then I will explain. This is a great example of my whole like leaving out things. Yeah. Thing. But I can find evidence of the past. I can check with the weather people and confirm that it rained this morning. And when you get that confirmation, it would instantly become the past itself. So in effect, you would be using the past, which does not exist, to confirm something else from the past. And if you repeat the process a thousand times with a thousand different pieces of evidence, together they would still be nothing but impressions of the past supporting other impressions of the past. Okay, so, okay. Two things, using the rain example. One, he's just leaving out the existence of a video camera. Like, yeah. Someone could record the rain. Two, shit's wet, man. It rained and there's wet stuff now. That wasn't wet before. Like, it's it's so insanely just sort of like leaving out all of the ways in which you could engage with the past yeah. except for remembering it. Like, yes, if the only thing you can do with the past is remember it, then it becomes dubious. But like, if I like, if Rory punches me in the face and my face is bleeding... I can be like, Rory punched me in the face and there's residual effects. My face is bleeding. Yeah. And it's not like a made up causal relate. Like this is the, this is why this book is, this is why I described it as like Socrates and CloudCon with CTE is like, they're not doing like challenging idea things. It's like someone says the dumbest thing on earth. And then the other guy goes, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And then they like move on. And like, that's it. <laughs> It's uh, it's like, uh, did you ever see Veep? Did you watch Veep ever? Oh, we love, we yeah, love yeah. Uh, you know Great Christopher show. Maloney's character, the the physical trainer who is uh, having sex with Selena in the third season or something like that. Yeah, and uh, he's really oh, dumb. He tries to sound season. smart. He says oh. like, <laughs> if okay. money is like money is only an illusion. He's talking to like uh, the head of the IMF or something. He said money is only an illusion. You know, it's not like we don't. We only believe in it because we we want to, you know, it could go away just any time. And then the IMF oh. person says, look, that's actually kind of a facile analysis. It's like, I do you love words. I love words very ardently. I tried. <laughs> it's it. Yeah, just a very somebody that does not have like nuanced stuff or has not bothered to study any of the literature on this, trying to intuit his way to uh 
well, uh, to something greater than that uh, previous literature. Actually, his denial of the past makes sense because, you know, he can ignore the past. That means all of it's an illusion. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to read books. I don't have to interact with it. I don't have to take it on. Uh, I don't have to uh, acknowledge it at all. I can just go ahead with my Scott Adams views on it. Yeah, it's just so it's just like I don't know, from perspective of someone who like writes and reads philosophy stuff. It's infuriating just because it's like you you it's not even like not engaging with the past or like intuiting like intuiting out your own theories of things is like i guess fine to do but like ignoring things like rain makes stuff wet mm-hmm. is just such an incredible amount of sort of hand waving anything yeah and which is like this is the like the plato and like the sarge's glaucon thing is like glaucon the character of glaucon isn't dumb He's just wrong. Mm-hmm. Like he makes observations and asks good questions. And then Socrates has to be like, hmm, good question, Glaucon. Well, let me explain. Mm-hmm. Whereas in this, this kid is just like, but oh, I can remember the rain. And he's like, ah, but that's all you can do. And it's like, no, it is not. <laughs> it takes that on faith that that's all you can do. All you can do is ask somebody if it rained is the only way you can check. Um, okay. I want to get into this chapter because this is sort of like the meat of uh, uh, Adams's philosophical theory here, his metaphysical theory here. And once again, I don't think I don't think he actually believes this. I just think he's extremely he thinks he's extremely clever for having come up with this. Yes. Uh, So here we go. God's motivation. If you were God, he said, what would you want? I don't know. I barely know what I want, much less what God wants. Imagine that you are omnipotent. You can do anything, create anything, be anything. As soon as you decide you want something, it becomes reality. I waited, knowing there was more. He continued. Does it make sense to think of a God as wanting anything? A God would have no emotions, no fears, no desires, no curiosity, no hunger. Those are human shortcomings, not something that would be found in an omnipotent God. What then would motivate God? Maybe it's the challenge, the intellectual stimulation of creating things, I offered. Omnipotence means that nothing is a challenge, and what could stimulate the mind of someone who knows everything? You make it sound almost boring to be God, but I guess you'll say boredom is a human feeling. Everything that motivates living creatures is based on some weakness or flaw. Hunger motivates animals. Lust motivates animals. Fear and pain motivates animals. Oh, it's a very strange. Okay. <laughs> also, this again, m- provably wrong. Sometimes yeah. I do things because I like them. Yeah, that's just. Not like because I'm having a problem. Easily refute. No, but that's a problem, Lux. That's a moral failing on your character, uh, on your part, because, you know, it's bad to want things. It is always uh, bad to want. Like, I, I guess he's taking the Buddhist approach to this. This is sort of like it's a Buddhist very idea. Weird. Because it assumes that, like, I play softball because of some inherent lack. Like, it's almost like Lacan stuff, except, again, really dumb. Yes, yeah. A god would have none of these impulses. Humans are driven by all of our animal passions, plus loftier sounding things like self-actualization and creativity and free. So humans are driven by this thing, except for all of these other (laughs) except for all of the, uh, (laughs) the things that I just mentioned right now. But God would care nothing for those things, or if he cared, would already have them in unlimited quantities. None of them would be motivating. Why? (laughs) Why? I don't understand how you can pontificate this clearly about the nature of God. I mean, so he... He has these, like... So there's, like, an interpretation of Nietzsche out there that mm-hmm. is like god is dead because we created the idea of a perfect thing and perfect things can't change and change is the definition of a living thing mm-hmm. which is like almost the argument that he's making as far as like it's impossible to imagine what god would want because there's like this omnipotence that is like imperceivable to the human mind or whatever but like instead all he's really saying is like uh like that imagine if if we could imagine God being anything, why not imagine it the way I've imagined it for no reason? Yeah. <laughs> and if it's like if it's like this way I made up, then of course the things I say follow that follow from that are true. Yeah. Is that's also a big part of this book, is if we assume that the thing I made up is true, mm-hmm. then what follows is also true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um 
I, I think what this feels like is a refutation of the god of Christendom who, who who does want things and who has discernible motivations and who is petty like a human. You know, uh, so we have conceptions of God of, of being motivated by something. But for some reason, he says that if there were a God, he would actually be like this because I can understand the nature of omnipotence. Yeah, exactly. It, it's yeah, this is about exactly right. Yeah. Um it's this crazy thing that he's doing throughout the book where, oh, well, we haven't gotten to it yet, but he, this actually does lead to an idea, which is where he reinvents a thing that already exists again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but in like a really stupid way. I don't want to spoil it until we get there. Here we go. Yeah. Oh boy. It's but coming he, up. He has a really good one coming it's, page it's we on? here somewhere. Uh, we're on page 42 for all of those following. Uh, So what motivates God? I asked. Do you have the answer to that question or are you just yanking my chain? I can conceive of only one. I can conceive of only one challenge for an omnipotent being. The challenge of destroying himself. (laughs) (laughs) So Scott Adams just just invented the can God create a boulder so heavy that he can't move it. Yeah, can God microwave a burrito so hot that he couldn't eat it? He did. He did that. He's the dead. only challenge for God is can God commit suicide? Is in some ways a very cool thought, but of course, in classic Scott Adams fashion, it gets flushed into a toilet of like a septic tank of idiot ideas, and yeah. the only things about it get left behind. You think God would want to commit suicide? I asked. I'm not saying he wants anything. I'm saying it's the only challenge. But then he wants something, you moron! <laughs> you fucking idiot! Yeah, ex- the, the, right. This is, this, my God, is that the core of this whole thing? Is like, uh, God, like, is him being like, well, the only challenge would be this. And it's like, well, you're you're assuming God would want a challenge, which is, again, a human perspective, the same as God wanting anything else. Yeah. And it's just like, it's the one you like, so it doesn't count. Keep in mind, this is the crux of the book. This is like the linchpin of the book where it starts getting into, like, the real philosophical ideas it's, behind it's everything. this and the chapter called God's Debris are yeah. the, two, the two core sections. Uh... I think God would prefer to exist than to not exist. That's thinking like a human, not like a God. You have a fear of death, so you assume your God would share your preference. But God would have no fears. Existing would be a choice, and there would be no pain of death, nor feelings of guilt or remorse or loss. Those are human feelings, not God feelings. God could simply choose to discontinue existence. There's a logical problem here, according to your way of thinking, I said. If God knows the future, he already knows if he will choose to end his existence, and he knows if he will succeed at it, so there's no challenge there either. Your thinking is getting clearer, he said. Yes, he will know the future of his own existence under normal conditions, but would his omnipotence include knowing what happens after he loses his omnipotence? Or would his knowledge of the future end at that point? That sounds like a thoroughly unanswerable question. I think you've hit a dead end, I said. Maybe, but consider the... (laughs) No, the kid has him dead to rights. This is a bunch of shit. This is a bunch of crap. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, but consider this. A god who knew the answer to that question would indeed know everything and have everything. For that reason, he would be unmotivated to do anything or create anything. There would be no purpose to act in any way whatsoever but a god who had one nagging question what happens if i cease to exist might be motivated to find the answer in order to complete his knowledge and having no fear and no reason to continue existing he might try it how would we know either way we have the answer it is our existence The fact that we exist is proof that God is motivated to act in some way, and since only the challenge of self-destruction could interest an omnipotent God, it stands to reason that why would only the challenge of self-destruction, if we've established that he's capable of desire by wanting to destroy himself, why would he not desire to create things as well? It makes no sense, you fucking idiot! (laughs) It it sounds, it's so much like um, Sky Adams' take on various uh like minorities or other culturally different folks where it's like it's conceivable that uh you know uh there's a giant army of black people hiding underneath my house getting ready to raid it and kill me with swords (laughs) thusly it must be the case Mm -hmm. and it's just like 
man, what? <laughs> like, it's so dumb. And he talks about how this is not like a thing that he necessarily believes in, but it's kind of clear that this way of thinking about things is yeah. very much a thing that he's like not mad about. Like he yeah. does this shit in his like blog all the time. Consider the possibility that X and then follows from there and is like, that's how we know that reverse racism is real. Yeah. If you c- complete a ridiculous hypothetical, it's it's constant straw mans. It's it's this and he would be the type of guy who would point out a straw man in anyone else's argument, but he's always building these weird effigies for himself. I just got hung up on the fact that like he he just said that like you you shouldn't uh, assume God has human motivations and then followed that with what also seem like human motivations, just different human motivations. Yup. So the problem with the problem with your conception of God is you think he's one kind of guy and not another kind of guy, which is the kind of guy that I am. Yeah. Like me, Scott Adams. God lives in a giant house made in the shape of a human head. Like I, Scott Adams, live in, the, in a house the shape of Dilbert's head. Right, I'm yeah. Creator and God of Dilbert, so God must be like me, and also live in a, a house the shape of the thing that he created. Yeah, presumably he's a white bearded guy, uh, and he's large. He's big too. We know yeah, that. This, this, is, this is all assuming that God exists as like a guy and yeah. not as some completely unknowable entity that ha- has motivations that would not even be comprehensible to a human. <laughs> yeah, and it's weird that he thinks, you know, it, there's a, like a motivation at all, because it's still imputing the idea that God has a consciousness. What if stuff just happens, you know? There is no control over it. There is no will at, at the center of it. What if God is a an entity without will that just it represents an expansion or creation, you know? But maybe he gets into that. I don't know. This does. Yeah, we'll get to that a little bit when we get to the God's Debris section. But like this does a little bit almost make me understand how he can believe that like he can do blogs that hypnotize you into coming in your pants. Mm -hmm. Like this whole thing of like, what if I like if we make a hypothetical claim and follow it infinitely um, and treat it as true because I said it Mm -hmm. because like I always think about this with Scott Adams in particular, but also other people is like. If you take one step back from the shit that they're saying, they've got to understand that it sounds insane. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, this kind of, like, provides an insight into how his mind can work such that he avoids that problem. <laughs> but <laughs> if everything like, is hypothetical, you know, then no one is wrong, really. I cannot be dumb because anything is possible. Well, and if you, like, assume, it's, it's that combined with I'm a smart guy, so the hypotheticals that occur to me are more legitimate by default. Mm-hmm. So I follow the thought process that led me to this hypothetical. It'll give me some sort of insight. The insight being that I can write a blog post about my date on New Year's Eve that will mi- force you to have an orgasm. <laughs> Speaking of um, uh, sort of orgasmic literature, he, we, we left up. And since the only challenge of self-destruction could interest an omnipotent God, it stands to reason that we dot dot dot. I interrupted the old man in mid-sentence and stood straight up from the rocker. It felt as if a pulse of energy ran up my spine, compressing my lungs, electrifying my skin, bringing the hairs on the back of my neck to full alert. I moved closer to the fireplace, unable to absorb its heat. Are you saying what I think you're saying? My brain was taking on too much knowledge. There was an overflow <laughs> that I needed to shake off the excess. The skull is cracking as his brain swells Ooh. up to an impossible size. <laughs> the old man looked at nothing and said, We are God's debris. Ooh, title drop, title drop. Here's Roll the credits, thing. baby. Yeah. God's debris. This is This is the section where it's like... This is the section where it's the most like this book is like everyone, every single thought in this section is something someone already thought of, but better. It's so yeah. good. Uh, let's let's dive right into it. Here's God's debris. Are you saying that God blew himself to bits and were what's left? I asked. Not exactly, he replied. What? Then what? The debris consists of two things. First, there are the smallest elements of matter. Many levels know the smallest things scientists have identified. Smaller than quarks? I don't know what a quark is, but I think it's small. (laughs) Uh, The dumbest boy in the world! He's the dumbest boy in the world! Uh, He's you. He's your self-insert character. He's you as a young man. This This is just like the Bhagavad Gita, and it's a conversation between the warrior Arjuna and, uh, and Vishnu. 
Uh, yeah, except not Vishnu. Get a bell on Arjuna's head, and Vishnu has no brain. Yeah, who is? It's not Vishnu in the Bhagavad Gita. It's who um, is, uh, is it Shiva? Uh, no, no. This is this is gonna bother me. I'm being, but I'm, I don't know. I'm gonna man. get it. I'm gonna get it. You pull it up. Pull it. Up, pull it up for us. Let's see, you got yeah. Will Smith, Matt Damon. Yes, Charlie's the legend of Bagger Vance is, is based on the Bag Vagita, <laughs> which is a very funny. It's very funny to turn that into a, a movie about a, a stereotypical helping black man character. Oh, it's, it's Krishna. It's Krishna. It's Krishna, yeah, not it's Vishnu. Krishna. Avatar of Vishnu. Yeah. Just like the avatar in this book. <laughs> yeah. Allegedly written by Ganesha. I didn't know that. That's cool. Oh, cool, cool. That's they, didn't have, they didn't have that note in the version that I read. That's cool. Right. Uh, yeah. So this is Arjuna's conversation with Krishna. But if they were really, really dumb, if they, if they were incredibly dumb guys. Um, smaller than quarks. I don't know what a quark is. Uh, Everything is made of some other thing, and those things in turn are made of other things. Over the next hundred years, scientists will uncover layer after layer of building blocks, each smaller than the last. At each layer, the differences between types of matter will be fewer. At the lowest layer, everything is exactly the same. Matter is uniform. Those are the bits of God. That is that is not true. <laughs> that is that is how can you qualify that statement? That is just you're just making shit up. Yeah, I mean stuff is made of stuff but like who knows man how like how do you know if you get smaller everything will be the same that just doesn't follow that's not based on anything how is yeah, this too... effectively different from saying that the universe itself is god but not in a way where he killed himself like what uh, what makes it necessary to suppose that god destroyed himself and not that all of consciousness is one thing which is a living god now rory it nothing <laughs> <laughs> no well, i think i have an answer to that and because because scott adams i don't think can conceive of the idea of god without a will so he has to make it so that god is some sort of dead uh animistic force or some sort of dead like material like he's some sort of inert material in order to show that he's not god anymore but the remains of god even though that he's still god you know uh Ugh. I don't, know, I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> this isn't what he believes, Rory. This we don't. We can't challenge him on this. We can't. Uh, uh, but it's like it, there, there is this thing where he's like, I tried to write a character who knows everything, mm -hmm. but then the character who knows everything is an idiot who doesn't know anything. Yeah, he reflects kind of poorly on Scott Adams as far as like his attempt to do this project, like. It's an ambitious project for a smart person to do, and watching a dumb guy try to do it is like one of the more mind bending things I've ever read. Yeah, try seeing a dumb guy write what he thinks the smartest person on earth would say is very is always a great exercise. Yeah, it's it's, it's so good. Um, what's the second part of the debris? I asked. Probability. Whoa! Whoa! So you're saying that God, an all-powerful being with a consciousness that extends to all things across all time, consists of nothing but dust and probability? Don't underestimate it. Probability is an infinitely powerful force. Remember my first question to you about the coin toss? Yes, you asked why a coin comes up heads half the time. Probability is omnipotent and omnipresent. N no? It doesn't have a will. It's not. It, it can't uh, be omnipotent because it has no willpower. Uh, also, it's so. This is one of my favorite things in this book is his total misunderstanding of probability, because the result of one coin flip does not result the affect the result of the next coin flip. There's no reason to believe that an infinite number of coin flips will have any given outcome. Only each individual coin flip is fifty fifty. Like, uh, if you but, flip a coin twice, there's no reason to believe it'll be heads once and tails another time. No, he. it seems like he sees probability as, like, a force, like the wind or, like, yeah, energy no, or magnetic magic. fields. Uh, what I'm taking away from this is that the most godly thing you can do is play CeeLo. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. If, if you want to experience true, the divine to will, it. roll some dice. Yeah. Big money. Yeah, yeah, the divine probability. Pay homage to God. The the any gambling really is is how you get closer to godliness. Oh, but the I purity love to hear, of the I dice, love to hear this. Bones. <laughs> this is good. My 
my my route to heaven is increasingly secured by this conversation. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, there, that would be cool. Like a gambling god, I would like that guy. Oh, that is sick. That would that would also be like a great character in D anD. d Yeah, it's yeah. A really just throwing good that D&D out there. Character. Anybody, anybody listening, starting a new campaign, perfect character. Yeah, God actually does play dice with the universe. Whoa! Oh, whoa! Um, probability is omnipotent and omnipresent. It influences every coin at any time in any place. No, it doesn't. It doesn't influence shit. It's just the physics influence. Right. It's like no one's flipping a coin to place with no wind and no gravity and air is not moving and there's no density in the air and the coins aren't scuffed. And like, like there's a million reasons why coins flip slightly differently at any given moment. Uh, but yeah, it almost, it's almost, uh, yeah, probability has willpower, you see? It's influencing stuff. We might see randomness in the outcome of an individual coin toss, but as the number of tosses increases, probability has firm control of the outcome. And probability is not limited to coins and dice and slot machines. Probability is the guiding force of everything in the universe, living or non-living, near or far, big or small. Now we're at it. He's just listing all the things. (laughs) All the the this could be immediately discounted just like materially by doing the experiment of flipping a coin a hundred times because like yes in abstract you have the like the supposed probability that it's going to be 50 50 but anytime anybody actually does that they're not going to get a perfect probability distribution yeah (laughs) which i think refutes the idea that like this is a perfect governing force that exists outside of the universe it's it's always probability it's always it's it's this thing that has no inherent will or motivation or doesn't push anything forward in the same way that physical properties or energy do but because it's a concept we use to describe chance it's it's a force um it's god's debris i mumbled rolling the idea around in both my mouth and my mind to see if that helped it was a fascinating concept, but too strange Not. to embrace on first impression. <laughs> you said before, it's not that strange, you fucking moron. Have you, uh, did you smoke weed when you were 18? This is, this is some basic shit. You know that scene in Animal House when the, Tom Hall smokes weed with Donald Sutherland and Tom and Donald Sutherland says, so entire universe could be in a single atom? That's what this is. This is the easy, the first conversation that you have when you get stoned with your teenage friends. Uh, you said before that you don't believe in God. Now you say you do. Which is it? I'm rejecting your overly complicated <laughs> definition of God. <laughs> the one that imagines him to have desires and needs and emotions like a human being while possessing infinite power. But your position of God is based on him having a desire. <laughs> it's like um, he's trying to square three things that don't who, that who cares. Like he's trying to square the ideas of like Newton's clockmaker God, right? Who just like sets everything in motion like quantum determinism of like the big bang happened and everything's just vibrations from there playing out probabilistically. And then also God as a thing with a brain. Yeah. And he's trying to have all three of these things happen at once. And it's like, Scott Adams, this is like, this isn't the simplest explanation. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're breaking your rules real bad. No, you see Lux, he's investigating that the simplex, as simplest explanations aren't always that simple though. You see, <laughs> he can break any rule. He, in the introduction, he set it up for himself that he can just, throw a bunch of bullshit on the page because this is all in service of the thought experiment, you know? It's a thought experiment, which means it doesn't have to be true or make sense or follow logically or, you know, have any insight. It's just bullshit, hypothetical. What if, you know? What if this thing could happen? The Honestly, frankly, the most compelling argument this book makes is like an Aristotelian argument about like the idea of ethos where it's like, the only reason this young man is listening to this old psychopath ramble like a madman is that he's old and has a fireplace. And it's yeah. like, oh, he has authority. He's established aesthetic authority. So I should listen to this man. And that's like the most interesting thought in this entire book, which it sure is unintentional. I think, no, I think you really hit upon something, Lux. I think that this whole book is sort of an exploration of aesthetic authority because what he's doing is he's showing you the language of how to like bamboozle or hypnotize a dummy into thinking that you're smart. Yeah, but I think he also thinks that it's smart. Yeah. 
He's like a guy. He's like a a mark who thinks he's a con man, you know. But he, yeah, exactly. He, yeah, it's uh, such a crazy thing. This book is like, uh, <laughs> this book is insane. It's it's really hard for me to process this text. It's it's so complicated. There's so many ideas. There's it's so short, many goddamn ideas. It, it short circuited me uh, multiple times today. Like I had like to calm down. <laughs> you had to go to the angry dome. Yeah, I had to go to outside and smoke three cigarettes and like stare at the wall. <laughs> and I'm rejecting your complicated notion of fixed reality that the human mind can, by an amazing stroke of luck, grasp. What? <laughs> You're not rejecting the idea of a fixed reality, I argued. You're saying the universe is made of God's debris. That's a fixed reality. Our language and our minds are too limited to deal with anything but a fixed reality. That's the point of philosophy is you use language. You use new words in order to construct. You moron. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this. Um, I feel like this is just like a bunch of people. Like uh, This is just a guy being like. Obviously, he can't do this because it would involve time travel. But he's like, what if all the people who bought Twitter Blue are actually the smartest people in the world? Is like so. how this book feels. I think they are because they ask a lot of questions. They're asking the right questions. The best we can do is to update our delusions to fit the times. We live in an increasingly rational, science-based society. The religious metaphors of the past are no longer comforting. Science is whittling at them from every side. Humanity needs a metaphor that allows God and science to coexist, at least in our minds, for the next thousand years? What? (laughs) Why does he just drop that there? If your God is just a metaphor, why should I care about him? He would be irrelevant, I said, because everything you perceive is a metaphor for something your brain is not equipped to fully understand. God is as real as the clothes you are wearing and the chair you are sitting on. They are all metaphors for something you will never understand. (laughs) Reality doesn't exist, folks. It's all in your head. Your brain in a vet, baby. Uh, Pants are a metaphor for a type of clothing that covers your dick. (laughs) (laughs) that's ridiculous if everything we perceive is fake just a metaphor how do we get anything done (laughs) every line is great imagine that you had been raised to believe that carrots were potatoes and potatoes oh my god he's doing the what if we're seeing different colors (laughs) yeah yep 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 yep. i I told you when rory said that before we finally got there we got to the greatest philosophical question ever asked Uh, And imagine you live in a world where everyone knows the truth about these foods except you. You, When you thought you were eating a potato, you were eating a carrot, and vice versa. Assuming you had a balanced diet overall, your delusion about carrots would have no real impact on your life except for your continuous bickering with others about the true nature of carrots and potatoes. Now, so that's just, it's just semantics. That's just a word to call something. That they don't well, the words bear no intrinsic meaning on the object themselves. You more. Ah, it's ah. so insane right it's like uh, it's like one of the hardest things to read and think about in the world it's so fucking dumb now suppose everyone was wrong and both the carrots and potatoes were entirely different foods let's say they were really apples and beets would it matter you lost no me. so god is a potato i joked <laughs> it's a great joke scott amazing joke whether you understand the true nature of your food or not, you still have to eat. And in my example, it makes little difference if you don't know a carrot from a potato. We can only act on our perceptions, no matter how faulty. The best we can do is periodically adjust our perceptions, our delusions, if you will, to make them more consistent with our logic and common sense. That That's so... I thought we were already under the assumption of that. That's the basic assumption when you're doing any metaphysical text, that you're bound by your consciousness. Why do you have to explain it like that? I guess because it's to the dumbest boy in the world. And because Scott Adams doesn't know anything. So he's starting from this, like, really, like, his starting points are, like, totally, like, just randomly based off of, like, the stuff he's read in magazines or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, he's no sense of the tradition in which he's ostensibly operating. So like the jumping off points for stuff are totally fucking random roll the dice shit. Uh, so, uh, 
I for, I forgot that he flirts with evolution denialism in this book. What? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, this next chapter is about. Uh, uh, seems like it's about evolution denialism in a weird way, but what if we thought about evolution differently? Yeah, the evolution thing is he's not saying it's not real, but he basically makes the claim that like it doesn't matter because like we can't prove the force that's making it happen, <laughs> even though we can. <laughs> and then he says we can't see it in day to day observation, but again, we can. And this is another good example of like, like there's a part later that we don't have to read, but that like where he talks about how like the moon's orbit of the earth is like probabilistic in some way. Uh And it's like, he's like, because if gravity were purely a tugging force, it would just eventually their moon would crash into the earth. And it's like, well, no, because the moon's also moving through space. Mm -hmm. And it's like those two speeds together create an orbit. And he just like leaves out the fact that objects are moving without the direct gravity that pulls them towards an object. No, no Lux, you see some some of the science is gobbledygook. Let's see if you can sort it out for yourself. <laughs> I, it's, it's fine to like just say an... wrong things. You can just say wrong things. And if you're being clever about it, it's fine. Right. But it's yeah, it's just like, oh, it's you just started off. I mean, like I tried to write a character who knows everything. And then whenever the character tries to explain things, doesn't know anything. Very frustrating. Mm-hmm. Why would why would a guy who knows everything have reason to explain things wrong? That this is entirely fundamentally self defeating. Yeah, exactly. And like, this is a guy who knows everything, and he's going to explain it all to the delivery boy who's dropping off a box, or did the box? No, the box the dropped him off. <laughs> the box dropped. What if? What, what if you were they, instead? Like, what I if your farts? <laughs> what in Soviet Russia? Box in moved Soviet here. Russia. Yeah, it's all Yakov Smirnoff joke for yeah. sure. Um, it also Look, reminds me of like uh, Missouri. Uh, did you, did you have my one of my favorite movies of all time is Mystery Men. And, oh hell yeah! Uh, the hell West yeah. Studi character, movie. the Sphinx, is always talking in these sort of vague Coens. It is if you don't master your fear, your fear will become your master. You know, it's all it's yeah. all this type of stuff. It's just reversing two of when the you nouns. Assume, that you make an ass of you yes. and me. Ooh. It's just like, this book it's so Fuck, hard man. for me to imagine opening this book reading the what if the package delivered you segment and then continuing to read and be like this is something worth thinking about like I... this is something to take seriously like it immediately like puts a kick me sign on itself and like farts and throws up and rolls over and then people like kept reading it to be like there's more useful information here yeah, my brain is spinning around in my head i never thought about any of this before <laughs> Uh, hey, in America, you watch TV, but in universe controlled by probability, TV watches you. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, this is like society of the spectacle. This is like some serious debord shit we're getting into. Um, so here's page 66, evolution. Let's get back to evolution, I said. With all your talk about God, do you think he caused evolution? Or did it all happen in a few thousand years like the creationists believe? The theory of evolution is not so much wrong as it is incomplete and useless. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, baby. He's, He's tickling our brains. He's making them spin around in our heads right now. How can you say it's useless? The theory of evolution leads to no practical invention. It is a concept that has no application, except for all the fucking, (laughs) the goddamn medicine that we develop in response to microevolution of bacteria every fucking year. It has a great deal of impact on stuff we produce, you moron. You old man, you stupid old man. (laughs) It's unbelievable, this book. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, I said, the dumbest boy in the world could do But you have to agree that the fossil evidence of earlier species is pretty compelling. There's an obvious change over time from the earlier creatures to the newer ones. How can you ignore that? Imagine that an asteroid lands on Earth and brings with it an exotic bacteria that kills all organic matter on Earth and then dissolves without a trace. 
A million years later, intelligent aliens discover Earth and study our bones and our possessions, trying to piece together our history. They might notice that all of our cookware, the pots and pans and plates and bowls, all seem to be related somehow, and the older ones were quite different from the newer ones. The earliest among them were crude bowls, all somewhat similar, generally made of clay or stone. Over time, the bowls evolved into plates and coffee cups and stainless steel frying pans. The aliens would create compelling charts to show how the dishes evolved. The teacup family would look like its own species. Presumably, the aliens would have the ability to understand what organic matter is if they have if they've mastered space travel. Are unless you, are they silicon? Are they clay aliens? Are they plate based aliens? I'll do you one better as far as I'm just, presumably the aliens would have heard of what a container is. Like yeah, they'd see uh, a thing with a handle and be like, this is an object for holding. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 we, we have no reason to assume that like aliens would have a form reminiscent of ours. Like there's nothing to say that aliens would have like legs, face, ar arms, whatever. But I I have to assume that in a, in a universe where other, a, other creatures exist, they would also have containers yeah, they'd be like, this cup's a lot like if, the cup's if weed. They've, they've never the seen of... a cup before. They've never thought of a cup before. They invented to... <laughs> They invented a flying saucer, but they've never seen a plate before. What do they put the fuel in? <laughs> they, it's everything is planes. Everything is sheets. They only have oh. sheets. It's the sheet aliens. Um, <laughs> and then they'd be like, this plate, it used to be one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, an observer who looked at the charts would clearly see a pattern that could not be a coincidence. The cause of this dishware evolution would be debated, just as we debate the underlying cause of human evolution. But the observed fact of dishware evolution would not be challenged by the alien scientists. The fact would be clear. Some scientists would be bothered by the lack of intermediate dishware species. Say, a frying pan with a beer. Okay, if you could view a microscopic cup evolving into a different microscopic cup, because we can do that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's every is, every chapter is. is just like, what if the dumbest possible hypothetical? And then this idiot boy, this idiot delivery boy, his brain spins around in his skull and he goes, oh, my God. This, this is clearly refuted by the opening sequence of the, the Dilbert animated series where yeah. you see an amoeba with glasses turn into a dinosaur with glasses, which turns into Dilbert. That's yeah. true. I would like to review the weirdly good Dilbert animated series uh, at, at one would, point. I'd love I would to love, love to watch that. That, that show that is would... so, because that's like Larry Charles, right? Yeah, Larry yeah. Charles. That's why Seinfeld yeah. was on it. One of his few guest appearances ever. He was on the stupid Dilbert show. Yeah, I would love to do that. That show was so much better than the books. Yeah, there's a, there's a great episode about art, which actually prefigures the AI art debate uh, a lot oh, in, in some in some very sort of canny and oh, prescient ways that I would let's like do to do that. Yeah, I would. I would like to that. review. I'm gonna go ahead and download it right now. Yeah, it's part of you put on Google Drive and send it to me when you download it. Yeah. Where this will be the next installment of our Scott Adams reading series. Will be our Scott Adams watching series. Uh, we are scott adams is bad at this but some he had some ideas that a better writer could do good stuff with yeah so yeah no because th that's the thing about like there are ideas in this book that if explored correctly could be interesting or fun to explore and like if, if a more unique writer had a uh had a handle on them or in many cases what? we're already explored by a more interesting writer yes. in way better ways like on, Descartes. on the torrent website i'm on we've got uh, some Dilbert books, and then a file labeled Dilbert Latino. Okay, I like that. I like that. Also, I like uh, like Latino countries all have like their own versions of Latino Goku, but they all have Latino <laughs> Dilbert as well. <laughs> I want to go to Taqueria Dilbert. Yeah, Taqueria Dilberto. Yeah, uh, that would be so good. Um, uh, <laughs> This might be the worst analogy ever made, I said. You're comparing people to dishes. The old man laughed out loud for the first time since we began talking. He was genuinely amused. It's not an analogy, he said with a twinkle in his eye. It's a point of view. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Evolution is compelling not because of the quality of the evidence, but because of the quantity and the variety of it. What are you talking about? We have quality of what are you talking? That doesn't all, make any fun. Whoa. Also notable that this person seems incapable of discerning the distinctions between quality and not quality evidence anyway. Yeah. It's uh, fucking this psycho. Is, this is what Charles Manson would do to people. <laughs> he would like find young impressionable girls and sit them down and be like, hey, what what if your fingers can think? What, what if, if you the were sky is actually purple? Until they just broke. This is a story about an old pedophile grooming a young delivery boy <laughs> by trying to break down his consciousness entirely. Yeah, the young boy is just rocking back and forth in, in a corner going, I am a plate. I am a plate. I am, <laughs> you know, after having uh, succumbed to the will of this old man. Uh, there's a big difference between dishes and animals, I said. With dishes, there's no way they can evolve. Logic would tell the aliens that there was no way that a non-living dish could produce offspring, much less mutant offspring. That's not exactly true, he countered. It would be said that dishes use human beings in a symbiotic relationship, convincing us through their usefulness to make new dishes. In that way, dishes succeeded in reproducing and evolving. Every species takes advantage of other living things to ensure its survival. That is the normal way living things reproduce. Right. Okay, so there's, uh, he's doing that scene in Star Trek where uh, Data asks Beverly Crusher if he's alive or not, and if fire is alive or not. Yeah, Data does so much of this book better just by being around. Yeah. Um, I gotta go do the gamers queue soon. Do you want to skip towards the end? Yeah, it let's just do, it. Basically, just does this shit. The rest of it is basically just constantly him being like, "Here's a dumb way to think about something," and then repeating himself. Okay, okay. Here's a great passage that I one that I noticed last night in the willpower segment. Uh, uh, ninety two, page ninety two. Willpower. You're very fit. The old man observed going further he's, to the he out. He's finally growing got out. to it. Um, I work out four times a week. When you see an overweight person, what do you think of his willpower? <laughs> I think he doesn't have that much, I said. <laughs> Why do you think that? How hard is it to skip that third bowl of ice cream? I'm in good shape because I exercise and eat right. It's not easy, but I have the willpower. Some people don't. If you were starving, could you resist eating? I doubt it, not for long anyway. But if your belly were full, you could resist easily, I assume. Sure. It sounds as if hunger determines your actions, not so-called willpower. <laughs> okay. No, you pick two extremes, starving and full. I said, most of the time I'm in the middle. I can eat a little or eat a lot, but it's up to me. Have you ever been very hungry? Not starving, just very hungry, and found yourself eating until it hurt? Yes, but on average, I don't eat too much. Sometimes I'm busy and forget to eat for half a day. It all averages out. I don't see how willpower enters into your life, he said. In one case, you overeat, and in the other case, you simply forget to eat. I see no willpower at all. <sighs> Exhausting. <laughs> I don't overeat every time I eat. Most of the time I have average hunger and I can eat average. <laughs> this is so, what the fuck is this? It's this incredibly like long winded, like we're, we're hashing out the numbers here. You might be 23, you might be 85 going on 35. Like, is he just doing this to pad we're, out the book? Cause that's what it seems you, like you it eat is. Food like a normal person. And yet yeah. you have these big muscles. <laughs> Let me touch the, your big muscles. <laughs> oh, I can feel the debris of a dead god inside of your <laughs> muscular bicep. <laughs> trying to trying to seduce and groom a teen by telling them you can feel the debris of a dead god in their muscles is like really insane shit. <laughs> it's pretty funny to think about. Uh. Yeah, this. Uh, let's let's skip right to the very end because it's uh, right. beyond the 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 strange fat phobia of our protagonist. Our our, our protagonist's hatred of fat people. Look, when I see a fat person, I think, "Damn, he could probably do that shit Rikishi does, where he just smashes someone's face with his ass." Yeah, yeah, that would be willpower if he did yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, let's get right to the end. Let's get uh, let's. The last chapter is called. After the After war, the war is the reference the religion war, baby. It's coming up. It's coming up. <laughs> I love that rocking chair. The young man said to me, 
How old is that? Oh, it looks like we switched perspectives. How old is that thing? It looks like an antique. I got it one year before the religion war. I said, yeah, baby, it's coming. Damn, she's doing some Avenger shit in this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is the prequel to the religion war, as you'll find out in the next page. <laughs> I'm glad that the war ended before I was born, the young man sighed. I can't imagine what it was like to be alive then. You are so lucky to have missed it. Were you in that war? Everyone was in that war. Let me ask you something, he said. Why do you think the war ended? We learned in school that everyone just stopped fighting. No one knows why. Although there are all kinds of theories about secret pacts among world leaders, no one really knows. You were there. Why do you think everyone suddenly stopped fighting? Put another log on the fire and I'll tell you. The young man looked at his watch and hesitated. He had many more stops before lunch. Then he turned towards the fire and chose a sturdy log. If you flip a coin, I said, how often does it come up heads? Okay, so this is the boy at the beginning has now become the old man. I see. I see. He has learned. He has learned. Yeah. He has become the smartest yeah. person in the world. And I think it's implied that he's also the protagonist of the religion war. He the is the protagonist. Of the, uh, but as we know from the religion war, uh, he doesn't actually affect anything. Uh, the religion war is ended by a woman's phrase. If God is so smart, why don't you fart? Why do you fart? Yeah, which is makes a lot more sense as a way of ending a war than anything else that happens in the fucking book. Um, it's so funny the way that I hope you enjoyed God's Debris. If you would like to get the hard copy version as a gift for a friend or family member or its sequel, The Religion War, just click, click the appropriate link below. And the links are God's Debris, The Religion War, the sequel to God's Debris, and of course, Dilbert Books. <laughs> And don't forget, comments Every on Adams at AOL.com. <laughs> yeah, he's on A. I wonder if he's still on AOL. And uh, I clicked on the link, and it just takes you to an Amazon search for Dilbert. <laughs> where Very the first lazy. result is a sponsored uh, res uh, listing for Calvin and Hobbes' uh, Attack of the Deranged Mutant Killer Monster Snow Goons which I think is probably a more significant philosophical text. Yes. So the one thing that we skipped that is somewhat funny and important, I just want to point out, is the part where, and this is like the plot stuff that happens, uh, is the part where the old man explains that he is an avatar and that the yeah. role of the avatar is to introduce new ideas and logics into the world to keep things from getting too crazy. Okay. <laughs> where he says... Um, People exist at different levels of awareness. An avatar is one who lives at the fifth level. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a whole Kabbalistic like tree of like structure to how you can ascend through the, the is awareness like intelligence. I asked. No, intelligence is a measure of how well you function within your awareness. Your intelligence will stay about the same over your life. Awareness is entirely different from intelligence. Awareness involves recognizing your delusions for what they are. Most people's awareness will advance one or two levels in their lifetime. What does it mean to recognize your delusions? When you were a child, did your parents tell you that Santa Claus brought presents on Christmas Day? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, he, he talked about that for a while, and then he gets to the part again. Uh, uh, he described what he called the five levels of awareness, that all humans experience the first level of awareness at birth, when you become aware that you exist. The second level of awareness, you understand that other people exist. You believe most of what you are told by authority figures. You accept the belief system when you are raised. The third level of awareness, you recognize that humans are raw and wrong about the things they believe. You really might be wrong with some of your own beliefs, but you don't know which ones. Despite your doubts, you still find comfort in your beliefs. The fifth, fourth level is skepticism. You believe the scientific method is the best measure for it is true, and you believe you have a good working grasp of truth thanks to science, your logic, and your senses. You are arrogant when it comes to dealing with people in levels two and three. The fifth level of awareness is the avatar. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a big jump. The avatar understands the mind is an illusion generator, not a window to reality. The avatar recognizes science as a belief system, albeit a useful one. An avatar is aware of God's power as expressed in probability and the inevitable recombination of God's consciousness. I think I'm a fourth level, I said, at least according to you. Yes, you are a fourth, he confirmed. <laughs> but now you've told me all your secrets in the fifth level. Maybe I get bumped up. Is that how it works? No, he said. Awareness does not come from receiving new information. It comes from rejecting old information. You still cling to your fourth level delusions. Um, and then, <laughs> da, 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 da. There is no reality, which is why, you know, when I'm taking your pants off, you know, this isn't happening right now. It only it only happened in the past. You know, this is why when I'm, you know, slowly drawing my index finger down the nape of your neck into your back, you know, it's uh, you know, that's not that happened in the past, man. You know, the past isn't real. Yeah. And then he, go, he keeps talking about that for a little while and talks about how leaders are yes. irrational. And then he goes, <laughs> well, irrational leadership must work. The world's chugging along fairly well overall. 
It's because people's delusions are, on average, in balance. The Avatar keeps it so by occasionally introducing new ideas when needed, which is kind of the Avatar The Last Airbender idea. The Avatar is to keep the elements in balance. Yeah, isn't the, sure. Isn't the Avatar also what he calls the main character in God's or in the religion war? Yeah, that is the main yeah. character in the religion war. But I think that character is the 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 boy, the young man in this book who has ascended to become the Avatar. Yeah, so having this is, the, this is his origin story. Yeah. Because he met this weird, he got groomed by this weird old man so he could yeah. save the world. And then he developed pattern recognition superpowers because everything is just God dust and probability. Yeah. And then someone made a t shirt and did his whole, all the work for him because it's, it's dumb to be this guy. Yeah. Uh... Um, but yeah, I thought that part was just important for, for plot context for the religion war. That it, it turns out this is the story of how he becomes a fifth level avatar brain genius. Uh, I, I really do think. Scott Adams, whether he believes in this or not, definitely believes that he was, you know, uh, you know, that gif of the guy writing down rap bars while everything is on fire. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was having that moment in his head. He was like everything. These do you think like I don't know if there's like some have theorized that uh, the 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 surgery that he went to cure his dystonia uh, resulted in him having like this megaloman more megalomaniacal or like more religion obsessed or like god obsessed uh, uh attitude it really seems as if there's something like pushing up against his occipital lobe that's causing him to have all of these like religious thoughts like he's just like he consumed a bunch of ergot recently <laughs> yeah there's also uh, some evidence of people uh it's particularly men going through uh, wild changes in their behavior and personality after suffering strokes. Hmm. Um, Do you think he had a stroke? Yeah, well, probably it's very likely that during the surgery, like something probably got disconnected for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, this whole shit is just like so fucking Or he was insane. always like this. I don't <laughs> think he was always, because there's like a definite... There's a definite, fairly sudden shift between 90 Scott Adams, who's like this almost like harmless Reddit type to, to like 2000s, like I am a brain genius, Scott Adams. Uh, it, and it could also just be the result of like wealth. Yeah. Could be that. Uh, it. The, the, yeah. the more rich and successful you become, it's easier to like, just justify that as well. Clearly I, I got to this point because I am an earth shattering genius. Mm -hmm. Only I could have come up with what if there was a guy who didn't like his job yeah and there was man. a little rat that was dumb and, and a cat who a was foreigner. conniving um man so i guess this is just a book where the dumbest guy in the world tried to write the smartest guy in the world and ended up writing two of the dumbest guys in the world yeah a pretty incredible achievement in a it's a great read it's a short read it, it reminds me of a kelly cartoon uh, like uh, from the onion where you yeah. try and like yeah. think about what the actual, like what the person writing this cartoon thinks actually. And your brain, it does make my brain spin around in my head because nothing connects to each other. And it's all just like errant ramblings of a moron. And yeah, listeners, but... you might think that like part of the reason we're making fun of being disconnected is that we just read random excerpts, but I read almost all of it and it's all like that. It's yeah. not, we didn't, it's, it's weird meandering nature isn't because we were weird and meandering skipping around. It's because the book is dumb. Yeah. There is so much fucking padding in this. Yeah. It does feel like someone Dude. was like, you have a 120 page writing assignment and he wrote like 40 pages and upscaled the type font and then just added random words. Yeah. He added various deliberations about whether yeah. something is average or not. This is an experiment since I have it as an ebook and not as a PDF. If I just resize it a little bit, all right. So that's about what a normal sized book the text would look like. Mm -hmm. This is now uh, sixty pages. Yes, it yep. is a it is a pamphlet. It is a manifesto, and not even like a fun one. No, not even a cool one. Uh, but did we learn anything? <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> I learned <laughs> that, um, let's see, what did I learn? I learned if old men start talking to you about hypothetical scenarios, walk away. You are Please. being groomed. You, you are in a room. grooming situation. I think I learned that, like, just like, I mean, uh, this is not a, I guess I didn't learn this, but just a doubling down on this whole, like, 
one of the funniest things in the world is dumb people writing smart people. Yeah. And this is just another example in like a beautiful, perfect genre. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I yeah. learned uh, if you understand that the mind is an illusion generator, not a window into reality, if you believe that, or if you recognize science as a belief system, albeit a useful one, if you are aware of God's power, present <laughs> po- probability, and the inevitable recombination of God's consciousness, you might be a redneck. <laughs> well, that's a good a, way to go out. That's a good spot to end it. Uh, uh, guys, do you have any plugs? You go first, Lux. Um, I mean, watch, watch Wisecrack videos. Uh, they're cool. They're good. I make them. Uh, I guess vote for Rory for best of Austin comics. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, that, that's my plug. Uh, the Austin Chronicle, which is Austin's alt weekly, uh, has a yearly award thing called best of Austin. And I am somehow nominated both for best cartoonist and best graphic artist uh i don't care about winning best graphic artist because i don't really think that i count as that and also there are multiple people in that category who I think deserve it more but uh if you live in austin uh vote for me please for best cartoonist and something cool will happen even if sure. you don't live in austin we'll do voter fraud with this cartoon I, competition. I can't cannot I, I cannot endorse this Okay, yeah, well, I'll be doing can... voter fraud on your behalf. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, and then there's um various wrestling shows coming up, so you can follow me on Twitter to learn about those. I guess, uh, at tail I... underscore boy. Yeah. yeah. And we'll you be can putting... find me the places that I'm at. I'm the only person named Rory Blank. It's very easy. There's no others? No, I, I've, I've, I've tried. I can't find anybody else with that name other than whoever it is who got at Rory Blank on Twitter and got banned. <laughs> Yeah, the the most other notable Alex Hood, which I guess I'm just saying my name now in these things, but he's a folk singer from Australia. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Why I want to meet him. When... Yourself Alex House. House is like an actual last name. Uh, there is th- there that. when I was a child actor, there was another actor called Alex House, and we got confused yeah. for each other all the time. Well, well, now you can take that from him. Yeah, you can rob him of his name and identity. <laughs> I will What's take your name. The name taker. I don't know. I think he was in some good stuff. Uh, I think he was in Todd in the Book of Pure Evil, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I, I, oh, cool. I don't know. No idea what he's doing. Well, people, you know, people fall by the wayside when you're living the fifth level avatar awareness. Yeah, life. yeah. When you just have too much awareness and you got use that awareness to, you know, do what anyone would do in that situation, which is invite young boys to look <laughs> in your, in your oh, house geez. and trick yeah. young boys into listening to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Alex House is a Gemini award. You can't go up against that. I can't fight that. You know, he's got a yeah. whole Gemini. Yeah, that's big. That powers. makes him a national treasure of Canada. Mm-hmm. Yeah, too bad. But yeah, that's how the cookie crumbles. All right, well, I got to run because I got to go uh, see if this gamer coup is staged or not. <laughs> okay. Bye, oh, everybody. Oh, oh, Thank oh, you so oh, much oh, for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Goodbye, friends. Anytime. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. There you go.